writing to the church in Rome, Paul said, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Well, as we come to God's word this morning, let us pray and ask for the Spirit's help that we might hear from him as he speaks to us through his word. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would continue with us this morning. We do, we have acknowledged our need of you, our God, to cleanse us of all our sins. We have acknowledged how far short we have fallen from the people that we ought to be in order to be pleasing to you. And we would look to Jesus Christ and ask that you would grant us forgiveness and you would continue to grant us your spirit that we might pursue holiness without which we will not see you. Hear our prayers as we seek your face to understand your holy word. In Jesus' name we, we plead. Amen. Amen. In the verse that I've quoted, the apostle, having laid out many gospel truths, is coming to the practical applications uh, in an intensified way in his letter to the Romans. And he tells them in summary format that he wants to draw them, he wants to urge them, he's seeking to, to motivate them by all of these mercies to present their entire bodies as a living and holy sacrifice which is acceptable to God. Every Christian in this place, whether you are 80 or 89, as Mrs. Bischoff is, though she's not here with us, or whether you are a believer and you are but four or five years old. However old you might be, God in the gospel has done something marvelous for you, a sinner, in sending his son into this world to take your punishment upon the cross and you have sought his face, and you have confessed your sins, and you have asked him to forgive you your sins, and you are trusting in Jesus Christ to take you safely to heaven. If you're a Christian, those things are true of you. And Paul has sought to explain that in the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. And then he says... You know that if God has done that for you, these great realities of what Christ has done for you are to motivate you to do something. That with your entire humanity, that with your entire being, body and soul, you would strive to live in a way that is pleasing to God. And strive to prove what his will is for your life. That which is good and acceptable and perfect in the sight of God. Is that not what your desire is in the depths of your heart? I know there's wrestlings. But is that not the desire of your heart? That you with all that God has given you would seek to please him? And so when we sang that hymn 418 and we went through those different graces and those different responsibilities, could your heart not go out and say, oh, that's right, I've not loved you, I've not feared you, I've not served you, I've not followed you, I've not done all that I ought. And so you're grieved that you haven't lived up to what Paul is urging the Romans to do. I'm appealing especially to you young people here today. 
you who say that you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, you who say that Christ has died for your sin, you who say that you are a child of the living God, if that is the case, then the will of God for you, that which is good and perfect and acceptable to your God, is this in part and in a very focused way, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God gives you. And I urge you, because of what Jesus Christ has done for you, present your entire body in obedience to God by honoring your parents. That's the will of God for you. Now, it's far broader than that, but at least it's in part that. Now, this commandment that we're looking at, this fifth commandment, which is the commandment which tells us something about God's structure for all of society. He gives something of a, of a foundational perspective on God's desire for society. Society should be well-ordered. That means there ought to be those who are in authority and those who are in submission to those in authority and they are to relate to one another in a proper way. And that's what God is seeking to set out in this promise, in this, in this commandment. I say promise because Paul tells us that this first commandment is the one that has an explicit promise. It is the first commandment with an explicit promise. And it is because it addresses the issues of family life, the first commandment governing human relationships. And we've begun looking at what is required by the fifth commandment. And what is required by the fifth commandment at its heart is that it is a matter of the heart. It is a matter of the heart. To show due respect and honor especially in the family relationships, means loving your parents. We saw that last time. And so I ended and pressed home Solomon's cry from Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 26. Give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my way. Now, if I preach this commandment right, and if I were to preach it with all of its detail and all of its power, the fact is, I doubt there's any one of us who wouldn't go out of this room confessing we have fallen short. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And which one of us has not fallen short in showing due respect to our President of the United States? Or due respect to our boss in the office who happens to be the most inept and incompetent person ever to rise to that level. Or so we think. Which one of us has not found ourselves falling short of honoring our parents? And you young people, if you think it's hard for you, imagine being an older person who's gained a measure of wisdom and experience in the world. Knowledge of how things ought to work. A real understanding of who we are and how things ought to be done. And then imagine that we have to submit to somebody. It's not easy. And it doesn't get any easier for your mothers to submit themselves to your fathers. And it doesn't get any easier for your fathers and mothers to submit themselves to any bosses that they might have outside the home. No, this doesn't get easier at any point in time until heaven. That's why at least two of the hymns we sang end with telling us about how glorious heaven's going to be when we will finally fear and love and worship and obey the way we ought. So if I preach this commandment and press it as I would like to, but I'm not going to because either I would be here all afternoon and then I would be guilty of what Mr. 
D Mr. Uh, Dreesey was talking about in the previous hour. Or I would be going on and on and on and on. This become a series on child rearing rather than on the commandments from the book of Exodus, the life and ministry of Moses. And so I'm going to condense it and I'm going to exclude a lot of things. But I want to tell you up front, if, this power, if the power of this commandment comes home to your heart and you find yourself wanting, there is a Savior who can cleanse you from all your sins. And there is a Savior who can give you all the grace necessary to fulfill this commandment in a way that is pleasing to your parents, pleasing to your boss, pleasing to the authorities in this land, and ultimately pleasing to God. It's possible to be pleasing to God because of Christ. And so if I forget and don't come back and press that home time and again, I want you to tell you right up front, Christ is the only way that any of us is going to fulfill this commandment. But in Christ we can, to the glory of God. So we've been looking then at what is required in the fifth commandment. And we've seen, first of all, it's a matter of the heart. Secondly, honoring your parents requires the use of your ears. It requires the use of your ears. Now, if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to the book of Proverbs. We're going to spend most of our time in Proverbs today, flipping back and forth in various passages. And I want to begin by reading a couple of passages in Proverbs which sound very much like the fifth commandment. And you would have thought Solomon was reading his Bible. As a matter of fact, he is, and he's applying it to his sons. And so he echoes this commandment. Chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Solomon writes what he said to his son. Hear, my son, and accept my sayings. And the years of your life will be many. I have directed you in the way of wisdom and have led you in upright paths. You can have a long life, he's telling his son. This was the basic promise given in the fifth commandment. It can be a good life. It can go well with you because you are walking in upright paths. And here's what comes before that. Honor me, my son, by hearing me. Look down a couple of verses, verses 20, and 20, 20 to 22. Again, Solomon addressing his son, my son, give attention to my words. A simple word for that is hear. Hear me. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to to all their body. How can a father say to his son, my words are life to those who find them? He can say it on the basis of the fifth commandment. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God gives you. And this godly father standing upon that commandment, pointing his sons to listen to him, says, this is the path of life for you. This is the path of health for your body. Sound very much like the fifth commandment. And in both cases, it's talking about our ear. For he says, hear, give attention, incline your ear. Now, honoring with your ears is more than just hearing the words coming from your parents' mouth. There's more to it than that. So turn with me to Proverbs chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, where he begins to explain what he means by hearing my words. And some of it are found in those verses in chapter 4, verse 20. So if you want to flip back and forth, I'm going to go back and forth between 1, 8 through 10 and 4, 20 to draw out these principles. It's more than just hearing the words. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are a graceful wreath to your head and ornaments about your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not 
consent. You see, the first thing is, he says, you must give attention. Give attention to my words. That is, focus the, the concentration of your mind upon processing those words. And your affections to want to embrace those words. And your will to want to follow those words. He says, give attention. In chapter 4 and verse 20, he uses that word, give attention. And he says, incline your ear. Remember how I talked about how God is an attentive hearer last week in Psalm 116. This word incline is the same word used of how God listens to our prayers. Well, in this case, it's not the, the tall person leaning down. It's the small person stretching up and saying, I want to hear. And so it's taking in those words. In chapter 1 and verse 8, he goes on, it's not only attention, but it's retention. Honoring with your ears is to, to give attention to the words, be there to hear them, think upon them, embrace them, but it's retention. Do not forsake them. Do not abandon them. Do not turn aside from them. Once you've gotten them, keep them. In 4.21, he says, do not let them depart. Sometimes we leave something behind because we turn away from it and walk in a different direction, right? Like the accident on my way to church this morning. I left it behind. I turned around, I went back, and I went a different way. I forsook that area and went a different direction. Sometimes those things, but we don't, it's not so much that we leave them, but they leave us. As every one of us can say when, for instance, somebody says, would you please remind your wife to give me a call? And the brain, like the sieve that it is, says, oh, sure. Pshh. And it wasn't that I forsook that commandment, it's that, or that directive, or that encouragement, or that, you know, that request. It wasn't that I forsook that request, it was that, it went from me. It didn't stick in my mind. And so in here he says, do everything that you need to to stay close to these words and keep these words close to you. Do things like repeat them to yourself. Write them down. Remind yourself, Tuesday, trash day. My job, take out trash. And you remind yourself, there's attention and retention of these words. And there's benefit. He says they're like a garland around your neck. He says they are a graceful wreath on your head. <coughs> they bring life to your body. Now I want you to notice in chapter 1 something else about these words. Because this comes up over and over. And I made this comment the last time we looked at this commandment. But look with me again at Proverbs chapter 1. And notice the context in which he makes these words known. We've looked at verses 8 and 9. Now verse 10. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us. The, son, the father is talking to the son in a context in which others are trying to get a hold of his son's ears. Others are trying to get into those ears that they might direct the heart, that they might direct the life. And the father says, listen to my voice. And when you hear these People talking to you to turn aside and do this or do that. Hear my voice in your ears. Retain it in your heart. Honoring requires your ears to give attention, to incline yourself to hear and then to retain what you've heard. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 also makes this point. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My son, if you will receive my sayings, 
and treasure my commandments within you. Make your ear attentive to wisdom. Incline your heart to understanding. And again, we have the issue of reception, if you will receive them. But notice the word he uses for retention. Treasure my commandments within them. Treasure my commandments within them. There is in my attic a big black footlocker that came from Colorado State University, or it went to Colorado State University, and it has stayed with me all those years. And in there are my treasures. My tracer gun, and my model cars, and some of my comic books, not a $2.1 million comic book, but other comic books. My treasures, and, I, and I've kept them and watched over them and carried them with me. Other treasures of even greater value are put in safety deposit boxes, in special vaults, in banks, and they're locked down. Why? Because they're too special to have out. They're, they're treasured away and kept for that important day when they're going to be needed. This retention of our parents' words, this retention of the authorities' words over us is a retention that's supposed to have with it a desire to treasure because we value what we've been given. We see the benefit and value of them and so we want to keep it and treasure it, protect it and value it. How many of you have treasured memories? What comes to your mind? Some time with a grandparent, some vacation time, some sporting event where you were able to accomplish something. You've got these treasured memories, right? How many of us have treasured memories of our commandments from our parents? How many of us would say that the rules and directives we got from our parents were treasured memories? They ought to be. They ought to be. We're to treasure those things. I mean, I'm supposed to treasure when mom says, clean up my room? Yeah. And someday your wife may thank you, thank your mother for that. Because you treasured that, you valued that enough that you say, I am going to Remember that and exercise that. They were treasured. In Proverbs 23, verses 22 and 23, he uses the language of commerce, by truth. But listen to the context of those words. Maybe you want to turn there. If you want, I'm going to go ahead and read them to keep moving along. Proverbs 23, verses 22 and 23. Listen to your father who begot you, and do not despise your mother when she is old, Buy truth and do not sell it. It's not saying go out onto the internet and go to Amazon.truth and somehow spend your credit card balance to get something. He's saying listen to your mother and father. Even though your mother is not old, do not despise her. Even though your father may give you something you don't like, don't despise him. But buy up those directives coming from your parents. Buy up that truth and do not sell it for anything. Most of the people I'm talking to here, most of you young people are in Christian homes. So you have parents who are at least attempting, though falteringly, they sang the same hymn that you sang. Only they were singing it with regard to their parenting abilities. You were singing it with regard to being a child. But they're trying, by God's grace, to try to live their life according to this book and direct your life according to this book. And so that is something worth buying up and not selling because in this way you get wisdom and instruction and understanding. And you say, but you know what? I, I don't want that. That's, that's hard. You know, or, or I do want that, but I just, I just don't seem to be able to, to value those things that my parents say to me. Look at verse 2 of Proverbs 2 again. Notice how Solomon writes to his son. He says this, Make your ear attentive. 
to wisdom. Incline your heart to understanding. He says, get a hold of your ear and draw it over toward your parents and make it listen. He says, he makes it clear. He knows it's not native. We don't come forth from the womb loving and being attentive to our parents. We come forth from the womb speaking lies. We are conceived in sin and we come forth with this sinful nature that wants to express itself in all sorts of ways. So we have to make our ears pay attention. Yes, you've got to work at this. And working at it doesn't necessarily mean you're a terrible sinner. It just means you're a sinner like every one of the rest of us. And you have to work against those sinful tendencies to do what God calls you to do. So, make your ear attentive and get a hold of your heart, which is inclined to all those things you see on the internet and all those things that you know your friends have and all those things you hear in the commercials and all those things you see at the stores and your heart is inclined to all your friends and to all your fun and to everything but your parents. Get a hold of your heart and say, No, heart, lean toward mom and dad. That's hard. I know that. I've got the same deceitful heart in my breast that you have. The heart is deceitful above all else and desperately wicked. Now by the grace of God, that is being governed and transformed, but nevertheless, that's the pressure that every one of us has to try to do what the will of God says, unless you're not a Christian, in which case you need to go to Christ. As a matter of fact, if you are a Christian and you're wrestling with that, guess what you need to do? Go to Christ. Proverbs 5 and verse 1 says, incline your ear. Proverbs 7 and verse 3, bind these words of your parents on your fingers. You ever do that when you wanted to remember something? Put a string around your finger. That's We used to do that a lot. Put a string around. Oh, that's to remind me. Or I know what some of you do, because I've seen the palms of your hands. Oh, I need to remember that. I've got a quiz next week. It's right there on the palm of your hand. Why? Because you don't want to forget. He says, bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. He says, work at this. Work at this. It's worth it. It's the first commandment with a promise. It is the way as a child and as a child of God to be pleasing unto God. So it's going to require our ears. Honoring your parents means attention, retention, inclination, acceptance, reception, holding, treasuring, all of these things. What kinds of words then ought you to be taking in from your parents? You know the kinds of words we like to take in? Well done, son. Well done, my daughter. I love you, sweetheart. But we like those words. I right? take those in. Good, take them in. Hold them close to your heart. They're, they're, there's instruction. They're, they're coming from your parents. Take them in. Hold on to them. But that's not all. The book of Proverbs is all about wisdom, you could say, isn't it? Finding, getting, keeping, growing in wisdom. And I know that wisdom ultimately comes from God. Proverbs 2 and verse 6 says so. For the, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come, wisdom, come knowledge and understanding. Wisdom ultimately comes from God. True wisdom ultimately comes through God and his word. But if you do like I did and read through the entire book of Proverbs and every time you come across some of these passages, what you'll find is that he constantly ties that to the words that are coming to you from your parents. And Solomon even does, gives us a personal testimony. How did Solomon get his wisdom? Oh, we all know, right? You know the story, 1 Kings chapter 3. There he is in the house of God and a voice comes, ask whatever you want. Ask what you wish me to give you, God says. And so he prays. 
So give your servant an understanding heart to judge the people to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge the great people of yours? And God says, in part, in answer to that prayer, I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart. So he got it by direct intervention from God. Direct impartation from God. That's where he got his wisdom, right? Well, he did. It says so. Well, turn to chapter 4 of Proverbs and see his testif- testimony about how he gained wisdom. <coughs> Again, how many times have you heard your parents say this? My dad told me, and now I'm telling you. I hear my dad's words coming out of my mouth all the time. I say, wow, I'd forgotten that he said that to me. Solomon didn't forget. Look what he says, Proverbs 4 and verse 1. Hear, O sons, the instruction of a father, and give attention to that you may gain understanding. For I give you sound teaching. Do not abandon my instruction. There he is. He's given the same instruction again to his children. Listen to me. Pay attention to me. I'm teaching you. This you need to hear. Now he's going to give personal testimony. When I was a son to my father, tender, and the only son in the sight of my mother, then he taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast my words. Keep my commandments and live. Acquire wisdom. Acquire understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will guard you. Love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom. And with all your inquiring, get wisdom understanding. Where did Solomon learn to ask God for wisdom? Where did Solomon learn, I am but a small child and this is a great task to watch over this great people and I need incredible wisdom to discern between good and evil when I'm going to judge them. Where did he get that self-assessment from? It didn't come from his own heart. He learned it. And he learned it in part from what he heard from his papa. And what David told him about the sin of one's heart. He says, I heard this from my father. Acquire wisdom. And that's where I began to learn wisdom. And now I'm telling you, son. I'm not telling you go up to Gibeah and offer a sacrifice and lay down there and wait there until God calls from you, calls from heaven and offers you wisdom. That's not where you're going to find it. You're going to find it right here, sitting at my knee, at my table, in my house, when we walk in the way, when we're going about our business, you are going to learn wisdom. Listen to my voice. The wisest man, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, the wisest man, as the Bible describes him, who walked on the face of the earth, says, here's how you Get wisdom. Listen to those in authority over you. Parents, teachers, elderly people who've got more gray hairs than you do, bosses, employers, listen. Listen. Your boss is not going to say to you when you blow the job, I I told you not to do it that way. I told you to do it this way. Oh, I forgot. Say that a few times to your boss. And you know what you'll hear? Oh, I forgot to pay you because you're not on my payroll anymore. Now, parents can't do that. And that's why parents put up with a lot more. And they bear with you a lot longer. But the principle is this. You must accept their reproof and instruction in order to get wisdom. You must listen to their counsel. This is where you gain wisdom. It's from their instruction. Here's where you need. Here's what you need to do. You need to 
the triple A's, okay? Triple A. You don't need triple A on your bumper sticker. You need triple A, children. Appreciate, acquire, and adopt their advice. Appreciate. That is, you need to say, you know what? Mom and Dad really have something to tell me. As the saying goes, my dad gets wiser the older I get. Appreciate that. Appreciate you've got parents who are telling you things. Appreciate it now while you're yet young. Don't wait till you're old and you realize, boy, I wish I'd listened to my parents. Appreciate it now while you can. And then acquire it. Acquire it. Chapter 4, 5, and 7. Acquire wisdom. Acquire understanding. <coughs> and then adopt it. Don't just hear their advice and say, oh, that's nice advice. Heed it. Follow it. It's just advice. I have the right. It's counsel. I have the right to reject it. Well, yes and no. You have the right to reject it. You also have the right to take the consequences. But if it comes from your parents, if it comes from somebody in authority over you, it's probably better just to appreciate it, acquire it, and adopt it. Proverbs 12 and verse 15 says, The way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. A wise man is not the man who has all the answers. It's the wise man who knows where to get the answers and listens when they're being spoken. Proverbs 13 and verse 10, Through presumption, the word is pride, comes nothing but strife, but with those who receive counsel is wisdom. Proverbs 15 and verse 22, without consultation, plans are frustrated. But with many counselors, they succeed. Aha! There's my verse. I have heard numerous people quote this verse. While all the while they were rejecting those who are directly in authority over them. And they went out and found all the counselors around them they could that would support them. And then they came to the ones over them and said, I've got counsel. I sought counsel. I asked my teacher about this. I asked so-and-so about this. Why didn't you ask your parents? I don't want to talk to my parents about this. I know what they'll say. Have you said that? I've heard that. I know what they're going to say. I, I knew what you were going to say, so I didn't even want to come talk to you. You know what that says? You neither appreciate or want to, uh, to acquire or adopt my counsel. It says you've already made your mind up to reject me. That's what that says. If you're getting the cult multitude of counselors and you're a child, you know where you better begin? Mom and dad. And then you can get other counselors as they see fit for you to have other counselors. Listen to Phil, Philip Riken. Dr. Riken said this, young adults have major decisions to make about education, career, and sometimes marriage. Children honor their fathers and mothers by seeking their counsel. And when you can't take the counsel of your parents and you think you have good biblical reasons for it, then you should have no problems telling your parents why you have good biblical reasons for not seeking their counsel. Especially if they're Christian parents. If they're not, then you ought to, have good, you ought to be able to tell your pastors, I have good and biblical reasons for not asking the counsel of my parents, and here's why, Pastor so-and-so, because Pastor Carlson or Pastor Chit Smith or Pastor Chansky, because, and then you know, we'll probably tell you, well, that's all very good and wise, but you probably should go ask your parents anyway. Oh, see, I know what you're going to say. But the problem is you don't want to hear it. You need to hear your parents' counsel. Receive that counsel. Just like Moses, who listened to his father-in-law, Jethro. There he'd led these people out of Egypt, and he'd done all those great things, and there he is out in the wilderness, and what does he do? Jethro comes to him and says, Moses, you're wearing yourself out. You need help. Sort this out this way and 
Moses, the great and wise man of God who had direct revelation from God along the way, listened. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that he said. Do you know where the rubber really meets the road? It's when you will accept their discipline and their reproof. When you will accept their discipline and their reproof. Proverbs 13.1 points to this. <coughs> A wise, man, wise son accepts his father's discipline. Literally, in the Hebrew, it's just a wise son, father's discipline. They go together. And that discipline can be everything from instructing you, I know what kind of girl you are, I know what kind of boy you are, and I know what, I th what is best for you, do this, this, and this. Or it may come to you in the form of reproof, stop doing that. That is dangerous for you. Don't go there. That's not good for you. Don't associate with them. They're not good for you. Or it comes a little more to heart. You are a proud, self-willed, stubborn child. Ooh. My son, sit down, I need to talk to you. You are captured by lies. And you're a liar. And if you continue in this path, you will not have trust of the people around you. Stop it. My daughter, you are a fickle, worldly, emotional girl. You need to stop and get a hold of your heart and live a principled life. You need to come under our care and protection. Talk to me. You've made some foolish decision. You see, that's when honoring your parents is going to come to the forefront. Do you have your ears? trained to honor your parents. To receive their counsel, to receive their reproof, their exhortations, their rebukes. So what about you? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. You're a Christian. Christian young person here. You're a Christian young person. Okay, here's the task. Who's got your ears? Who's got your ears? Your iPod and your iTunes that you've downloaded and you're filling your ears with what you're downloading off the internet that your parents have no idea what you're listening to? your friends who are there in school, even if it's Trinity Christian School or a Christian homeschool group, do your friends have your ears or do your parents have your ears? One man grew up in the, in the inner city. He told me he was afraid of his mom. He came to be an adult. He was a virgin, drug-free, and never got involved with gangs. And you know why he said what kept him? God's grace kept him. Because every time a gang member or a drug dealer or a prostitute came up to him or some woman that was acting like one, he heard his mother in the background saying, I'm going to whoop you. And he was more afraid of her than he was of them. His mother had his ears. And when you're sitting in your classroom on college campuses and you've got professors with all of their intelligence and all of their abilities and they're speaking into your ears, they're trying to get your ears so that they can lead you astray. And so you ought to be coming home or writing home, or frequently talking to parents and saying, you know what I heard in class today? I heard somebody say this. That sounds pretty good. 
so that your parents can come down with their Bibles and say, but wait a minute, son, daughter, how does that square with this? And if your parents have your ears and you are the one who is honoring your parents and inclining your ears toward them, then you are going to constantly be looking for their input on the things that you've heard. But you don't understand, my parents don't have an education. They don't have a master's degree, and I'm going for a master's degree. Man, I'm going for higher education. <laughs> oh, how I love thy law. David said, it makes me wiser than my teachers. Amen. And if they know this book, they're worth listening to. Well, I'd hope to get to necks, backs, and a few other parts of the body this morning, but I only got to ears. The young people, older people, are your ears inclining to the truth? Are your ears open to those in authority over you? Ultimately, are your ears open to the fountain of wisdom, God himself? Are your ears open to hear what God has to say about how to parent your children so when they come to you with these questions, you know how to answer them? Does God have our ears? Do our parents have our ears? May God help us to present our bodies a living sacrifice and may it in one sense begin with our hearts and our ears that we might truly be able to walk in the path that we ought to go. Let's pray. <coughs> Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we have not heard you as we ought. We've not inclined our ears often to you because the affections of our hearts were running in the path that we knew you did not want. And we didn't want to hear the rebukes. And we didn't want to hear the counsel. Forgive us, O oh God, that we have not listened to you as we ought. And Father, please work in the hearts of every young person in this place, Christian or not, that they would hear your words speaking to them to honor their parents by giving attention to their words, by inclining their hearts toward them, by inclining their ears toward them and preserve them from danger, preserve them from sin, and lead them in the path of righteousness. Hear us as we cry to you, O God, that you would write your word upon our hearts. And by your spirit, you would make us more holy or you would save us from our unholiness. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.